Oh, okay, good. Okay, hello everybody. I'll call this meeting of the Waco ISD Board of Trustees to order. A quorum is present. I want to welcome everyone who's watching this meeting on Waco ISD TV, cable channel 17, or online at wacoisd.org forward slash live. On March 16th, the governor granted a request from the state's attorney general to temporarily suspend certain open meetings laws in order to allow video conference meetings in response to COVID-19. In accordance with those suspended rules, we certify the following. Members of the public may watch this meeting live, as I just stated on WISD TV, channel 17 on Grande and Spectrum and online at wakeisd.org forward slash live. Notice of the meeting was posted online at least 72 hours ago. To comment on the agenda, members of the public were instructed in the notice for the meeting to submit their comments in writing to Joshua Wucher via email by 10 o'clock last night. Although members of the board aren't gathered in a central physical location, we do have a quorum in attendance at this meeting by video conference. We're meeting by the use of Zoom, which allows for two-way communication. There is no limit to the number of people who can stream the meeting live. All other meeting procedures will adhere to our board adopted procedures to the extent practicable. All items to be discussed or voted upon have been posted in accordance with state law. A video recording of this meeting is being made and will be posted on the district's website at a later date. And if you have questions about these suspended laws, please contact the Office of the Attorney General by calling 888-672-6787 or by emailing toma at oag.texas.gov. Okay, the next item on our agenda as posted is closed session. I uh, propose that we amend the agenda and move closed session to the end. Um, does anybody have an objection to that? Okay. Seeing none, uh, we will move the closed session item to um, after item 12, announcements. Okay. Uh, so um, next is public comments. It's my understanding that we have received public comments that they were sent as instructed to Joshua Wucher by 10 o'clock last night. So at this point, Josh, if you would please read the comments that we have received from members of the public. Absolutely, Madam President, thank you. Um, and I will just preface that a number of these comments, um, some of them have been edited down a little bit to um, maintain the three minute time frame of public comment. Um, and I was, I did notify um, those individuals that the entire original public comments will be sent to uh, the board later this evening. Okay, good. Our first uh, public comment is from Marty Van Wagner. He writes, I urge you to keep schools physically closed until this pandemic is under control. We are overwhelmed with new cases every day. Hospitals are reaching capacity and it's only getting worse far worse than when you close schools in March. I understand that this is about money and political pressure. I know times are brutal, but please do the right thing. Don't send children, youth, teachers, staff into a situation that is certain to kill a percentage of them. This next comment is from Ava Merritt, a teacher and coach at Indian Spring Middle School. She's also a parent of a freshman with the intent to attend University High School in the upcoming school year. And she's a grandparent of students attending West Avenue Elementary as well as Indian Spring Middle. She is asking for a delayed start date and extension of the school calendar. She writes, please start school after Labor Day so teachers may equip themselves with a virtual classroom to fit the needs of all students. Allow August for teachers to assess online learning platforms, become diverse in online technology, and explore the district's technology choices to adapt or construct online teaching strategies. She also asks to extend the school calendar 
or consider school year round in anticipation of 100% remote learning. Our curriculum pacing guide can be adjusted to spend more time on heavily tested TEKS and skills needed for the next year without rush. Students can explore while developing content understanding and contributing to their social emotional development through collaborative activities. She also asked to allow teachers to choose their schedule. There are teachers who wanna be in the classroom and others who do not. Please allow teachers the same opportunity as our district families to choose what they feel is safe for them. It can be understood we all have to concede to the needs of our students. She also writes about added health and safety measures, asking to assess the need for hiring more maintenance staff, adding hand washing stations, sanitizer pumps, and hot water throughout schools, as well as contemplating the use of plexiglass for added protection around student and teacher desks to maximize class size. Please request and to approve Superintendent Dr. Kincannon and her task force to commit to creating a proposal of a later start date with an extended calendar and provide teachers with an option to teach 100% in person or 100% remotely or a hybrid blended learning um, experience or a half day preference morning afternoon or a week in person or week virtually. As a health safety measure, approve any extra steps needed to sanitize and disinfect our schools thoroughly. Granting options to teach where we are most comfortable helps alleviate anxiety. It may also reduce the risk of teachers becoming infected, the spread of the virus and need for substitutes offering a continuum of learning for all students. Please keep in mind those that you serve are at the greatest risk. I appreciate your consideration and all your future efforts to ensure our district's success. The next comment comes from John Smith. He asks the board and or the task force discussing the possibility of school still starting on time, but instead utilizing the three week online option from TEA. This would allow us to start in person instruction um, and not be pushed back. Uh, example of online instruction would be August 18th to the September 4th, then start in person instruction after Labor Day. I believe this is San Antonio ISD's plan and it seems to be better than pushing school back until after Labor Day and losing more time. As someone who is planning for a family, even a few weeks pushed back is harder as that means less time off and availability in the summer. Additionally, if school days are extended, are teachers being compensated for the additional time in their contract or is this contracted time to be at school still the same amount? The next comment is from Lovey Langston who writes the COVID-19 virus has caused a terrible disruption in the lives of our fellow Wacoans. The closing of our schools affect the continued education of the students, but it also disrupts the dynamics of the family. We all want our schools to reopen in a timely manner for the beginning of school. However, we also want our students to be as safe as possible. The CDC guidelines for social distancing and masks do not work if the numbers continue to rise. I hope the school board waits until the number infected by COVID-19 shows a significant improvement before reopening schools. The next comment is from Rachel Crawford. She writes, Dear Waco ISD board members and Superintendent Ken Cannon, if campuses open this fall, please consider allowing teachers to teach temporarily, either from campus or from home, by matching on campus teachers with on campus learners and online teachers with online learners. <coughs> Teaching remotely may be an especially important option for high school teachers, as evidence is accumulating that teens may spread COVID 19 as often as adults and are likely to be asymptomatic characters. Uh, also offer a hybrid plan that's working well for many colleges like UT Dallas, where students and faculty motivation and morale are high, despite the pandemic. Even though there are differences among levels, teachers of all levels with support and supervision can maintain quality education online, especially if all involved have chosen to teach, learn remotely. I know a young Waco High teacher who is preparing to resign, break her lease, and move in with her parents if required to begin the fall teaching from campus. I also know veteran WISD teachers preparing to resign if not offer the option to temporarily teach remotely. She asks also, would you please clarify precisely who is empowered to decide whether or not teachers will have the choice to teach from campus or from home? If teachers in general will not be offered the choice or their conditions or situations that will qualify certain teachers at higher risk to work from home and who exactly would be empowered to grant or deny those requests? With so many parties involved, it's sometimes difficult to know where the buck stops. Thank you for your consideration and your service. W.J. Pearson writes, if schools reopen, teachers should be offered the choice to teach either from campus or from home by matching campus teachers with campus learners and online teachers with online learners, rather than all teachers spending eight 
hours, five days a week in a crowded building in a county with high circulating virus levels. Teachers deserve to decide for themselves their level of on-the-job exposure to COVID-19 based on their age, underlying conditions, and family situations. Students already get to choose to work from campus or from home. Teachers deserve the same choice. The board members should want the best for teachers and students too. The next comment is from Albert Jean Bell. His grandchildren and relatives attend various schools in Waco ISD. He writes, I support the Waco NAACP's position against WISD opening schools for classes in August. The NAACP statement expresses my sentiments exactly, so I ask that you share this statement with the board members and school board superintendents during the school board meeting this week. The next public comment does contain that Waco, AA, uh, Waco NAACP statement. Priscilla Houston writes, Dear Waco ISD superintendents and school board members, Greetings from Ms. Houston, a member of the Waco NAACP chapter. I write to inform you that I stand with the NAACP in opposing the opening of the Waco ISD schools for in-person classes because it is a known fact that public gatherings, i.e. schools, will enable the coronavirus pandemic to spread throughout Waco much faster, claiming more lives and hospitalizing more citizens. Distance learning is not ideal, but is presently the safest option in light of the surge in coronavirus cases in Texas. The Waco NAACP's position on school opening is that we desperately want children to return to the classroom. We also believe that Waco ISD schools should open when it is safe for children, faculty, and staff to return to school. We are deeply cognizant of the educational, social, and material losses that students have and will experience as a result of not attending school in this global pandemic. We are aware that many Waco ISD students do not have adequate technological means to take full advantage of online education. We understand that some students fare better in face-to-face -face educational environments. Nonetheless, we are also deeply conscious of the impact of the pandemic in the communities from which a majority of our students come. We are watching positive cases of COVID-19 rise to historic levels on a daily basis. We are watching the death toll rise on a daily basis. The health of our students and everyone involved with educating them Bus drivers, custodians, cafeteria workers, support staff, teachers, and administrators must be at the forefront of everyone's minds as Waco ISD School Board makes decisions on when students, faculty, and staff return to school campuses. Some students, faculty, and staff live with and come into regular contact with people who are immune compromised, pre-existing medical conditions who are at risk of death or serious harm from COVID. Some students, faculty, and staff are in the at-risk population because they have pre-existing medical conditions. We can bring students back from academic losses. We can work to mitigate technological disparities. We also know that children are incredibly resilient and will be able to recover from the losses caused by the coronavirus pandemic. It will be harder to help children bounce back from losing family members, teachers, and others. It will be impossible to bring dead children back to life. For these reasons, we respectfully request that you delay opening schools until the coronavirus pandemic has been contained so that it will be safe for students, faculty, and staff to return to school. Please think about them as well as the citizens whom they encounter outside the school and in their homes. Please keep everyone in Waco safe during this pandemic. Thank you for your time and consideration. The next public comment is from Jaja Chen. She writes, as a trauma therapist, social worker in our Waco community and wife of a former WISD high school teacher, here are a few thoughts and perspectives I have regarding reopening schools this fall. When rolling out the plans for reopening, please consider the needs of teachers and staff, particularly those with high risk concerns, pregnant teachers, those with autoimmune concerns, high risk health conditions. By providing options for these teachers and staff should they need accommodations as schools reopen. This could include hybrid teaching options for teachers, a mixture of in-person versus online prior to rolling out 100% in-person ensuring fully stocked PPE for all teachers and students, paid time off for teachers and staff who test positive for COVID-19 and provisions of plans on how teachers and staff navigate health systems and testing should they have symptoms. In addition, many have argued that schools need to reopen for the mental well-being of children, for their socialization and connections in person. While I do agree that school is a pivotal part of connection for children, we must also consider the impacts on mental health that can occur should we reopen too quickly without rollout plans on prevention and response. A surge in COVID-19 caused by the reopening of schools would disproportionately impact communities of color in our Waco community. As a community, we must ensure that all populations have access to accessible, affordable COVID-19 testing prior to reopening schools. It's pivotal 
for us to consider the particular needs of each school as a result and to consider the impacts on physical and mental health of teachers, staff, and children should reopening in person occur too quickly without detailed plans. The next comment is from Jimmy Jones. He said, many grandparents are taking care of kids, especially after work or after school. I'm a 78 years old with asthma and diabetes. I see how many grandparents are picking up their kids after school. The chances are very good that many students in a 5A school will come to school and catch the virus or the teachers will. And if those little kids infect their grandparents and kill them by accident, what are you going to do then? Schools should be shut down for the first half and then opened up in the second half if the virus goes down. Don't let those children unknowingly infect their grandparents. It will affect them for the rest of their lives. You need to take the grandparents into consideration when you make your decision about school opening. The next comment is from Michael Moulds. He writes, to safely help the students and Waco ISD school employees safely transition to a more normal school setting. I believe it's the best option for balance between physical and virtual classroom attendance. The intent is to provide an environment for all employees and students to safely and as practically as possible transition to the traditional classroom environment given how COVID environment changes improves over time. He asked to create two student groups, A and B, determine which grades make up the student groups as some grade levels, pre-K through two may not benefit from virtual. He asked for a weekly attendance schedule with Mondays having group A on-site, group B being virtual, and flipping that on Tuesday, two virtual on Wednesday, virtual and on-site on Thursday, as well as on Friday. And he asks for Wednesday and Saturday to be used for cleaning and sanitizing on-site between student groups. Also asks to ensure students are compliant with distancing, touching, coughing requirements while on-site. He also suggests using a rope with a clasp or other tool to define the six feet space to space between students out, uh, to, to space the students out in gyms, halls, anywhere they go. He also asked to ensure all employees are provided with masks and gloves. I provide these suggestions for the safety of all students and employees as no one should be put at risk and as much as possible, the risk should be mitigated. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard. The next comment is from Todd Nafe. He writes, Texas is reaping the consequences of its haphazard reopening of the economy. Now our state and federal officials are pushing to force thousands of students and teachers into school buildings during a pandemic. I urge the board to delay reopening, train teachers and students to use remote learning tools and make up any deficits when it's safe to do so. The next comment is from Mary Duty. Uh, she writes, ironically, the school board does not meet in person at this time because of concerns about COVID-19. TEA is working from home. The State Board of Education meetings are not in person either. Children deserve the same consideration as the grown-ups. We are in a game of hot potato from school boards to the U.S. Department of Education on school openings. But when all is said and done, you are the first line of defense for the children. Your leadership will possibly mean life or death for students and for teachers. We can make up for lost time, but we cannot save the state with the lives of our students. I taught for 16 years. We explored history through drama, arts, and even food. Our study of social studies was aimed at showing young people how they had a place in their history. They learned how they could be a force for change in their world. When the classroom was buzzing with ideas and debate and discussion, there was no place like it. We must get back to the classroom in due time. Middle school was my spiritual home. And one thing I know is this, middle school students will understand that something is not quite right on this push to get back when their state and local leaders talk confidence but meet via Zoom. I appreciate your service as school board members. Your job is not an easy one, but please don't ever think that young people won't know what is going on. Quick fix, open schools now solutions will never stand the test of time. And when it comes to the lives of any of the children or staff in Waco ISD that you serve, you must err on the side of caution. We can make up for lost academic progress, but teachers cannot raise children from the dead and neither can any of the grownups making these life and death decisions. Put the lives of children and your teachers first. Thank you for your time. The next question or the next comment is from Haley Nafe. She writes, hello, Waco ISD school board members and Dr. King Cannon. My name is Haley. I'm a 2020 Waco High graduate. I'm very concerned about the situation, uh, what the situation will be like in the fall amid this pandemic. I started a petition for allowing teachers to have the choice to decide for themselves whether they want to go into school and get exposed to COVID-19 or to work from home to reduce their exposure. 
Here's the text of my petition, which had 168, uh, 163 signatures as of 9.45 p.m. on July 15th. Thank you for your consideration. I know all of you want the best for teachers and students. Waco ISD students will have the choice to work from home this fall, but teachers won't, no matter how many students are attending the school online. Teachers are still required to be on campus every day as of now. COVID has been proven to be worse on adults, especially those with pre-existing conditions and are over 50 years old. This is the case for many of our teachers. The state says we can follow social distancing guidelines in schools, but let's be real, schools can't even get students to keep their hoods off. TEA employees are working from home. College professors get the choice to work from home. It's not fair that they're forcing public school teachers who could die if they catch it to go into a room full of people. It's like playing Russian roulette. My father has taught in Waco schools for over 20 years. He's over 50 and has pre-existing conditions. Many of my past teachers fall under that category as well, along with friends' parents who work in the district. This is unfair to teachers. Students get the choice and so should they. Everybody's life matters. And the final comment of this evening comes from Ashley Bean Thornton, who writes, Dear Waco ISD Board of Trustees, First of all, I profoundly appreciate your service on the school board during this difficult time. I can only imagine that you have had many sleepless nights worrying about the best way to move forward during this health crisis. Thank you. There are certainly no perfect solutions to the challenges presented by this crisis. Every choice has serious negative consequences, yet decisions must be made. Given that, I hope you will seriously consider postponing the start of school until after Labor Day and then extending the school calendar later into June. If it is contractually possible, teachers could start work on the regularly scheduled date. The benefit of that strategy is that hopefully that will be enough time for us to see reduced coronavirus infections as a result of the current more stringent mask requirements. It would also give teachers additional time to prepare for leading virtual classes as well as their regular in-person classes. I'm sure you will have no trouble thinking of many problems with this idea, but it seems all the ideas have problems. This to me seems like the least disruptive. After all, it was not so long ago that classes didn't start until after Labor Day anyway. As a district that has already suffered tragedy as a result of this virus and the loss of Mr. Perry at Carver Middle School, I know that everyone has the health and safety of children, faculty, and staff foremost in their minds. I appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts with you, and I deeply appreciate your service to our community. And that will, con um, that will end this evening's public comments. Okay, thank you. And just as a reminder to our viewers, um, we are um, not able to respond. Of course, this platform makes it difficult to even respond to folks commenting, but um, we're unable to engage in a conversation at this point about um, the comments that have been provided to us. Although later on in the agenda, the plan is going to be presented and we'll have an opportunity to discuss it at that time. Um, next on the agenda is, um, well, and I just want to say also that um, I really appreciate the 15 people who took the time to share their thoughts with us. Um, uh, that's, um, that shows a commitment to our kids and our staff and our community, and um, that, that should be commended. Uh, with that, Dr. Kin Cannon, I think you're up with superintendent's report. Thank you and good evening to everyone. Um, I would like to introduce um, three um, administrators this evening. First up is Courtney Whitaker. She'll be stepping up to serve as the principal of Providence Heights Elementary School um, following Debbie Sims retirement this spring. Courtney has been with Waco ISD for six years. Um, she starting at, started at Provident Heights as an instructional specialist before moving into the assistant principal role. And prior to that, she spent six years as an elementary school teacher in Carrollton Farmers Branch. Um, she holds a bachelor's and a master's degree from Texas Woman's University, where she also minored in special education. So I think Courtney's on the line. Courtney, would you say hello to the board? Good evening, Waco Board, uh, ISD Board of Trustees and Dr. Ken Cannon. I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity, and I really look forward to serving the students, staff, and families of Provident Heights Elementary. 
Thank you, Courtney. And Courtney's already working. <laughs> We're preparing for next school year. Um, thank you, Courtney. The next person who I would like to introduce is uh, Lena Ortiz. She's another uh, familiar face in Waco ISD. And she will be serving as the principal of Parkdale Elementary School following Marsha Henry's retirement. Lena is a 12 year educator. Did I freeze? No, you're good. Okay, great. <laughs> Looked like I was frozen for just a second. Lena is a 12 year educator with experience as a classroom teacher and instructional specialist at Kendrick Elementary, where she was the teacher of the year for 2011, 2012. And most recently, she has served as an assistant principal at Cesar Chavez Middle School. She received a bachelor's degree from the University of Mary Harden Baylor and a master's of educational administration from Tarleton State University, where she is currently pursuing a doctoral degree in educational leadership. Lena, would you please, please say hello to the board this evening? Hello, Waco ISD School Board and Dr. Ken Cannon. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to grow as an instructional leader in Waco ISD. And I'm very excited to be part of the Parkdale family and serve the students, the staff, and the community of Panther Nation. Thank you, Lena. We're so excited uh, for both you and Courtney taking on these uh, campuses for us and um, having been a part of the Waco ISD system. Appreciate you. And then lastly, I'd like to um, introduce another familiar face. Denise Bell has returned to Waco ISD as our Director of Accountability Systems and Data Analysis. She comes back to us with 26 years of experience in education, including a combined 11 years previously in Waco ISD, where she was a classroom teacher and an instructional specialist at multiple campuses across all grade levels. She has been the coordinator with the Education Service Center Region 12 for the past seven years, uh, most recently in the superintendent and campus leadership department. She received a bachelor's degree from St. Joseph's University and has a master's in curriculum and instruction from Concordia University. And we're really excited to have Denise join the team um, we spent a lot of time with Denise this last year on um, building our understanding of the A through F system, and we'd like to welcome her to Waco ISD. So Denise, would you please say hello to the board this evening? Good evening, school board, uh, Waco ISD school board, and Dr. Kim Cannon. It's truly a privilege to be able to come back to Waco and to serve the Waco campuses and students and teachers and administrators. So I'm very happy about this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And we're very excited about you and Courtney and Lena as well. So um, that ends the superintendent's report. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you, Denise. Okay. Uh, let's see. I got to get back to my agenda real quick. Uh, we have uh, next is the consent agenda. We have two items. The um, 2021 student code of conduct and the 2021 student handbook. Um, does anybody um, want to pull one of those from consent and discuss further? Um, and if not, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, I move that we accept the consent agenda. Uh, Thank you, Ms. Cordeweg. Anybody up for a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Mr. Badania. I've got a motion a second to accept the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Raise your hand. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. Passes unanimously. Um, thank you. Next is... Um, the big ticket item tonight, uh, view and discuss planning for the 2021 school year, Dr. Kim Cannon. Thank you. Um, I believe Josh will put the presentation on the screen for us there. Um, I just want to start by thanking everyone who has participated 
um, in developing the plan that we're going to present to you this evening. We've had a lot of input um, that we'll talk about as um, we proceed, and we've had a lot of a uh, lot of work done internally. So I'd like to thank um, Kyle DeBeer for his work, as well as Laura Robertson and all the staff who have been instrumental in um, doing this work. So um, we have been at this since um, graduation and um, the story has unfolded over time with the TEA guidance and guidelines. And so tonight we have quite a bit of information to share with you. Um, we want to answer your questions to the best of our ability and um, lay this out to you, um, for you, so that you understand how we got here. Um, I'd also mention that, um, you know, this situation is fluid, as you all know, and this today we learned that there's another meeting yet tomorrow, a special called meeting with the commissioner um on friday so we're expecting some kind of news tomorrow we don't know what that will be yet so i just want to remind everyone that this is um definitely this situation definitely um continues to be fluid so i'm going we're going to share the presentation this evening um kyle de beer our chief of staff will start um and he's going to speak to the data that we have gathered and then I will um, finish the presentation by talking about the plan. So Kyle, I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Dr. Kincannon. One of the things we wanted to do to start this evening was to talk a little bit about how we got here. And really the story of COVID-19 in Waco ISD starts on March 13th when we announced that all of our campuses would be closed for at least two weeks. As we go through some of these milestones, you'll see where case counts were in the state and in McLennan County. And one thing that I would note is that we're drawing on the state's data set, which means uh, in most cases that the county counts lag by a day. So if you've been following those closely, you might see some numbers showing up a day later than when you thought the county had announced them and you'd be correct. So on March 13th, we announced our closure. The following week, Governor Abbott announced that schools would be closed through at least April 3rd. At the end of March, the governor extended that closure through May. And then in mid-April, the governor announced that campuses would be closed through the rest of the school year. At that time, there were a little over 17,000 cases in the state of Texas and 76 cases in McLennan County. In mid-May, TEA started to issue guidance to school districts for how to operate summer school programs. And at that point in time, with a little less than 50,000 cases in the state, TEA advised school districts that there shouldn't be more than 11 people together in a classroom at any time. Um, this is kind of a significant milestone because in hindsight, this looks like a point in time when the spread of the virus was relatively controlled in the state compared to where it is now. On June 9th, TEA revised that same guidance to replace the hard cap of 11 people in the classroom with a combination of square footage, spacing desks six feet apart, and then a, if all else fails, cap of 22 students. Um, at this point in time, still less than 100,000 cases, less than 80,000 cases in the state and 132 cases in McLennan County. This past week, we received TEA's guidance for the 2020-2021 school year, which drops any sort of limit on the number of people that can appear to be together in a classroom at one time, and simply says, where feasible without disrupting the educational experience, encourage students to practice social distancing. And that takes us to where we are this week. On Wednesday, there were 7,307 new cases in Texas. That's nearly 70 times as many just new cases in Texas as there were total cases in the state at the time the governor initially closed campuses. And so there's, there's something that's happening in both of these trends, in the trend of cases increasing pretty dramatically as time goes on, and in the trend of the state backing back the, or dialing back the restrictions on the number of students who can be in a classroom, essentially to make sure that there's nothing in the way, it would seem, of allowing in-person classes to return as normal. And we think that's an important context to have for the parameters that the state has laid out up to this point for school districts. And also just as a reminder of what we've seen in our own county and across the state this past spring. 
The other thing we want to talk about a little bit is the student engagement that we saw this past spring. Late in the semester, the state issued some guidelines for how to measure student engagement. And these guidelines are a little different from what we were reporting to the board at various points through the spring. So you'll see that the numbers aren't quite the same as what you've heard. But overall, the state said, we will consider engaged completing assignments in core classes. And we want to look at engagement at two points in time. The first is from when campus is closed to the end of April, and the second is for, in our case, the month of May, basically, from May 1st to the end of the school year. And they basically, between those two points in time, broke kids into four groups. The first are students who were fully engaged. Those are students that were engaged in completing courses in the first period of time and then continued to stay engaged and complete courses in May across the state, in our district, across our different grade spans in our district, that's certainly where the vast majority of students were. And district-wide, we saw 77.5% of students engaged in completing courses throughout the time or completing assignments throughout the time that our campuses were closed. The next group that the state defines are those students who they look at as engagement recovered. These are students that during March and April, we either weren't able to contact at all, or we were able to contact them, but they weren't engaged. They weren't completing assignments. And then in the month of May, they came online. We were able to reach them and they were engaged in completing assignments in their core classes. And what you'll see here is the number of students in Waco ISD that we recovered uh, in that final month is notably higher than the number of students that were recovered uh, across the state as a whole. The third group the state defined were those students with no engagement, meaning they, they were, we were able to contact them, but they weren't completing assignments in either time period or lost engagement. They started out completing assignments, but didn't complete assignments in the month of May. And then the final group are those that we either couldn't contact at all or we lost contact with in May. You can see how the district compares to the state as a whole. Of course, our population, our demographics look a little different than what the state looks like as a whole. So that kind of brings us to where we are today with a picture of what the spring semester looked like for our students and for the district. And we want to take a minute to focus on the parameters that TEA has put in place for school districts at least as they exist today, as Dr. Kincannon noted, we're expecting uh, some changes, although we don't have any clear picture of what those changes might be tomorrow. So the rules of the road for school districts looking at 2020-2021 as of today are first, that districts must provide a daily on-campus learning option, and that option has to meet the state's minimum of 75,600 minutes of instruction for a year. So essentially that's a, a full-time five day a week in-person schedule. Once you meet that minimum, you can layer other options on top of it, like a fully remote option or an option that combines remote instruction and in-person instruction. Um, the hook is really all about funding and in order to receive Funding for any type of instruction, on-campus instruction must be offered for all grades served by the campus every day for every student whose parent wants them to access on-campus instruction each day that a, a campus is providing instruction. There are a couple of small exceptions. The first is an exception that the state has carved out for the first three weeks of the school year starting whenever your first day of classes is, and that's an exception that's intended to allow school districts to phase into the school year, but for that three week period, you can remain remote. Now we've heard the governor say in media reports that that period might be extended, but we haven't actually seen anything concrete yet from TEA on what that would look like. The second exception is if there's a confirmed case of COVID at a campus, that there are some opportunities for the campus to close up to five days, but TEA has capped in that scenario, how long a campus can close for. And actually, I've heard the commissioner say on at least one, I think two conference calls, that it's the agency's opinion that even with a confirmed case on campus, a campus shouldn't need to close in-person instruction for more than a day. Um, and then the third sort of emerging exception is what we've seen happening around the state, which is that a local authority can order campuses to close for in-person instruction. And this is another place where we haven't seen 
concrete guidance from TEA, what we've seen indicated so far is that it doesn't appear that the, the governor would override that sort of order from a local health authority and that if districts offered remote instruction during that period that a local health authority said they couldn't hold in-person classes, that they would receive funding. But it's another piece where all we have to go off of are some comments that have been made in the media and we don't actually have any specific guidance from TEA on how that would work. Regardless of what form of instruction you're using, whether that's in person or remote, districts will be required to take attendance daily for all students this year. That's a change from where we were with remote instruction this past semester. Also, the TA and the commissioner will not be waiving minimum attendance requirements. That's a 90% a requirement in most classes for students to receive credit for the class or truancy years for the 2020-21 school year. I mentioned a second ago what the options are for closing in-person instruction and serving all students remotely in the event that there's a confirmed case of COVID-19 on a campus that gives up to five days, but it is limited to the campus. TEA is pushing for it to be less than the five day period, even though they'll allow up to five days. And TEA is pushing school districts to look closely at whether or not the entire campus needs to close or just a classroom or set of classes. Um, TEA has said that the state is going to administer the STAR tests again in 2020-2021 and that students will be expected to perform on the STAR tests and in turn school districts will be assessed and rated for accountability on the basis of the STAR tests. As part of the health guidance that we received last week, there's a directive that districts have to require teachers and staff to self-screen each day. Um, there's also the guidance that we should consider screening students for the signs and symptoms of COVID-19 as well. Uh, in accordance with the governor's order at this point in time, anyone 10 years or older has to wear a mask when in a public building or a public space that includes school buildings and school buses. Um, and then finally, there's that guidance on social distancing, which is so different from what we saw back in mid-May, where feasible without disrupting the educational experience, um, we should encourage students to practice social distancing. What I would underscore about these last four items that are part of the rules of the road and the public health guidance is that those are really a baseline and districts have the opportunity to layer a different additional health precautions on top of that. And Dr. Kincannon will be talking in a, in a few minutes about some of the additional precautions that we plan to take here in Waco ISD. So understanding the rules of the road and where we've been from, we began planning on June 8th for the year ahead by pulling together a task force of about 50 people from around the district. It included classroom educators, campus leaders, district leaders, community members, anyone who really wants to get a picture of who was on that task force can find a list of members at wacoisd.org slash COVID-19 task force. And then that larger group split into three smaller groups to talk specifically about planning for elementary, for middle school, and for high school. They looked at a variety of different things in each of those working groups and then came together to talk about them as a whole. Uh, the first thing that the groups looked at were different instructional options that might be offered to families. Those ranged from on one side, 100% in-person instruction all the way to 100% remote instruction with numerous hybrid options in between that would blend in-person and remote instruction. Looked at changes to scheduling, including delaying the start of the school year, extending the school year or the school day if necessary to build up some additional time in the minutes of instruction for the year. And then across all of those were a series of additional considerations with equity, the social emotional needs of students and the needs of our employees at the top of that list for weighing those instructional and scheduling arrangements. We also wanted the task force to be informed by an understanding of where our families are and where our teachers are and what their preferences are. So we conducted surveys of both families and teachers to understand where our families are, we asked opinion an, excuse me, we asked opinion analysts to conduct a telephone survey of a randomly selected sample of 400 parents and guardians 
that was conducted this past week. We chose this methodology because we know when we put out an online survey and just ask families to self-respond, there are some differences between the families that respond and fill out the survey and those that don't. In particular, internet access plays into that. And we thought that internet access might be a significant factor in how families view planning for next year and also how they experienced the past semester. We started out by trying to get a clear baseline understanding of where our families were and asking in the survey if families were comfortable with sending their child to school if campus is open in the fall for in-person instruction. And what we saw was that about two thirds of our families are either somewhat or very uncomfortable with the idea of returning to school. Now, we broke this down to make sure that we were understanding any differences between different groups of our families. So we looked at whether they had children in elementary, middle or high school. We looked at race and ethnicity. We looked at whether or not they had a student at a campus that's operated by Transformation Waco. And we also looked at whether or not they had a student in some of our special programs. And as you see, as we kind of look through those different charts pretty consistently, there's a little variation one way or the other, but that uncomfortable number stays really right at about two thirds of our families, no matter how you break out the demographics. And there may be some fluctuation in the intensity. For example, you see there's a little more intensity in how uncomfortable our special education families are and a little less intensity in how uncomfortable our limited English proficiency families are. But in both cases, about two thirds of our families are saying that they feel either somewhat or very uncomfortable returning to school. Because there's so much similarity between our families, no matter how you look at them, the rest of the numbers from our family survey that I wanna share with you are really just top lines. They're gonna look at how our families as a whole respond because we don't see large variations on any of these questions based on demographic categories. So we asked some questions looking back on the past semester to understand the experience that our families had. And one of the things that we asked was how they would rate Waco ISD's handling of the pandemic. 78.3% um, of our families said that they would rate the district's handling as either excellent or good. Um, you know, certainly we know that we have room to go and we know that there were some families that this was not a good experience for and we have to do better, especially if those are families that choose remote learning in the fall. But I think it's heartening that we're starting at a place where generally a lot of our families had a positive experience or if not a positive experience, at least a good experience this past spring. We then started talking about planning for the fall and we asked our families to tell us whether they support or oppose a variety of different scheduling options. And so we asked them to take a look at 100% remote, 100% in person, some different hybrid schedules. And generally what you see is that our parents were pretty positive on most of the options, most positive on 100% remote, least positive on 100% in person. So then we followed up and said, okay, we get a sense of where you are individually rating these options. Overall, what's the option that you would most prefer for your students in Waco ISD? And that's where you see that 100% remote was favored by about a third of our families, following with a range in the 15 to 20% for some of our different hybrid schedules, and then a little over 13% saying that their preferred schedule would be 100% in-person instruction. Um, what I think is significant is if you look together at those hybrid options, you actually see a slight majority of our parents saying that in one form or another, their preferred scheduling option would be to have a mix of in-person and remote instruction. Um, and we'll circle back to this theme because it's something that we heard from our teachers as well. We also asked our families how they would feel about additional steps that we might take to provide a safe environment on campus when students return. Generally, our, our families are very positive about daily temperature checks, about requiring masks, and about limiting class sizes to 15. That's about where that limit would be on that revised guidance that we re received from TEA for summer programs if you applied that to most of our classrooms. 
And finally, we asked about some ways that we might change the school schedule to try and build up a little bit of a cushion of instructional minutes so that in the event that for one reason or another we needed to close and either couldn't or didn't want to shift immediately to remote instruction, we could be closed for a small period of time without eating into the minimum 75,600 minutes of instruction. And what you see is that our, our parents were pretty mixed on both increasing the length of individual school days as well as increasing the number of days in the school year, but overall slightly more approve of increasing the number of days and slightly more disapprove of increasing the length of the individual school day itself. We shifted from interviewing uh, families to share that information with the task force to surveying teachers to make sure that our task force understood what was top of mind for our educators in the classroom as well. We chose a different methodology for our teacher survey for a couple of reasons. In this case, we conducted an online survey and we invited all of the district's 993 teachers to participate in it. Ultimately, about 693 teachers or just a hair under 70% of our teachers did submit at least one response to the survey. And um, we chose a different methodology for our teachers in part because one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to start identifying and really drilling in on teachers who had specific circumstances that made them concerned about returning to the classroom. Um, and in many cases, what came out through the, the survey that we conducted with our teachers that those circumstances are being driven or those that uneasiness is being driven by either being at a higher risk for severe illness from COVID-19 themselves or having someone in their household who's at a higher risk if they were to be exposed to COVID-19 and bring it back into their household. We started in the same place though with our teachers. We wanted to understand how comfortable are they with the idea of returning to the classroom on campus in person with students and you see really pretty similar numbers. About 57% of our teachers said that they were either somewhat or very uncomfortable. A majority, just like our families, but a somewhat slightly smaller majority, our teachers are a little more comfortable than our families with the idea of returning to in-person instruction. We did the same thing in breaking out our teachers a couple of different ways to see if there were significant differences by demographic group. You can see here some small differences, mainly in intensity based on grade level. We also looked at if there were differences between teachers who taught at a campus operated by Transformation Waco and teachers who taught at other campuses. As with the data from our families though, what we really saw is that there aren't big differences between teachers depending on where they teach or what grade level they teach. So here again, um, as we go through the, the rest of the data from our teacher survey, I'll show you overall responses from all 693 teachers who responded. The next thing we, we asked was to, to flip the question and ask how comfortable our teachers would feel with remote instruction and delivering that instruction uh, from home. We saw significant number said that they were very comfortable or somewhat comfortable. But notably, um, you have some teachers who are somewhat or very uncomfortable delivering remote instruction. And I think that speaks to the importance of some of the professional development that's underway right now. Um, and that Dr. Kincannon will note in when she talks about what the, the plan for the road ahead looks like. We asked teachers what their preference would be and our teachers are actually fairly evenly split between preferring to teach remotely or preferring to teach in person if they had their choice. 45.3% said that they would either strongly or somewhat prefer to teach remotely. We followed up with those teachers who opted to teach remotely or who said that they would prefer to teach remotely to understand what was driving that. We asked them an open-ended question, but we also asked those 301 teachers, if teaching remotely isn't an option, how likely are you to agree to teach students in person? We had 46 of the 301 teachers who told us that they were not very likely or not at all likely to agree to teach students in person if teaching remotely wasn't an option. And in those open-ended questions, we saw what you would probably expect, which is that a lot of those teachers are making that decision or have those concerns because they themselves are at higher risk of severe illness or they have someone in their household who's at 
higher risk for severe illness. We moved from talking about how teachers felt about returning to the classroom to asking them to tell us if they would support or oppose different instructional arrangements. Same set of arrangements that we asked our families about. Um, and here you see some slight differences between our teachers and our families, but generally the same preferences shake out. And then we asked, as we did with our families, if you chose just one of those scheduling options, what would you prefer? The difference here is that the top option that teachers chose by about 0.3% was alternating days, one of those hybrid options. Next was the 100% remote. And then down at the other end, you saw a little bit of a change in that um, one of the hybrid options was actually the least selected preferred schedule um, instead of 100% in person. But what's definitely consistent for both our families and our teachers is that if you combine those hybrid options, you see a majority with our families, it was 51% of our families who said that they would want one of the hybrid options. With our teachers, it's 54%. So there's a lot of appeal in that idea of having a mix of in-person and remote instruction. Next, we talked about lengthening the school day. We gave our teachers some background on those rules of the road that we covered before. We also talked about or asked about increasing the number of school days. Um, as you can see, there's a bit of opposition in both of those cases, a little more opposition to the idea of increasing the length of the day than increasing the number of days in the year, but overall still pretty evenly split there as well. Finally, we asked teachers about what we could do as we take steps to try and minimize the potential spread of the virus to make them feel safer or more comfortable in their classroom. And we gave them a longer list of options than we gave our families, um, but we asked them what they felt was most significant for making them more comfortable in the classroom. Um, far and away, the thing that our teachers thought was most significant for their safety was limiting class sizes to about 15, which is that sort of social distancing formula that the state offered for summer programs when they removed the hard cap of 11 people in a classroom. Uh, requiring masks was pretty clearly the second choice of what to do to help teachers feel safe in the classroom, followed by daily student temperature checks. Um, we also wanted to engage teachers and talk with teachers in another way. So we hosted a thought exchange event um, to have a little bit more of an open-ended conversation with our teachers and understand what's top of mind. That was kicked off with a, a live event that Dr. King Cannon hosted. Do you wanna talk a little bit about the thought exchange process and, and what we heard there, Dr. King Cannon? Sure, happy um, to do that. Thought Exchange is a um, program that allows for some crowd sourcing. So teachers or are, are any audience is able to, um, to put down their, their thoughts, their ideas, and then um, share those anonymously. And everyone who is participating in the exchange can then um, rate the thoughts of others. And so what you have is um, everyone looking at each other's ideas and you can see which ideas are most common among a group. So um, you can do this either by just sending a link out or um, we chose to do it live uh, in a virtual event and then sending the link out later so that every teacher could put could participate even if they weren't on the Zoom meeting. Um, but I did have about 350 teachers who participated on uh, last Friday. In all, there were 775 who put in thoughts. There were 1,290 thoughts that were um, included in the exchange and then they rated um, over 34,000 thoughts. So it was really informative. Um, it was great to get to talk to the teachers in that kind of an event and allow them just to um, discuss everything that they were thinking about and that they were concerned about for the new school year. So the word cloud that you see on the next slide um, picks up the words that were most often mentioned in their thoughts. And as you can imagine, they pretty much mirror the information that we've been discussing already about positive cases and about remote instruction 
about being exposed, about safety and health and family. Um, and it, it was just really um, informative for us. So um, based on all the data that we've received, information discussed in our task force meetings since June the 8th and all the, all the survey data and the teacher thought exchange, we do um, have a plan that we wanna discuss this evening. And that plan, go ahead and switch to the next slide, would be um, to offer parents the choice of 100% in-person instruction and that would be um, like a typical school year where students would come to school every day, Monday through Friday. Um, the other option that parents have would be to select remote instruction where um, students are working at home using our new learning management system, um, which would be Seesaw for our elementary students and Canvas for our secondary students. Um, families will choose, make one of those choices um, for the fall. Um, all core courses and most of our electives will be offered both in person and remotely. Um, there may be some courses that we aren't able to offer um, remotely and so we'll be working through that over the next several weeks. Um, and then students who are receiving full-time remote instruction will still be eligible to participate in extracurricular activities. So there's been a lot of talk about that across the state. Um, we've, we want every student to continue to have those, uh, the ability to participate. And, and um, so we'd like to do that. Um, on Ju beginning July 27th, we'll send out a form in our online registration process for families to select their preferred option and for those who have already registered, then we will send them reminders to log in and make their selection. Um, and, and then we'll have campuses um, who have office hours um, to assist parents with registration and selection process also. Um, and then lastly, I would mention here that um, parents will commit to either an in-person or remote instruction for at least a full grading period. So if they are um, in person and decide to change to remote, they can do so, um, but we ask that they do that at the end of a grading period. Um, so we have some kind of a continuity within our classrooms. And I might also mention that um, TEA has said that parents, we don't, we can't lock parents in until two weeks before school. So it's likely that um, the registrations that we get early could change over time as people, if people were to change their minds. So um, Kyle shared some data that hybrid options were, that people were interested in those, both parents and um, our teachers. So why, why are we not proposing a hybrid option at this time? And I would just say um, that the hybrid option um, is a really good option for um, Waco ISD and other school districts, but it has been abandoned um, by us and some others through conversation because it doesn't allow for um, social distancing because of the state's requirement to have 100% in-person instruction, we can't guarantee um, even if we did the hybrid that we could provide a, a social distancing. And so and that's the appeal of it. The appeal is that you can have some control over the numbers of students who are in a classroom. Um, it adds another layer of complexity to the work that you're doing because you're at, you have a, an in-person and 100% remote and then a hybrid model. Um, and so it becomes more challenging. Um, some of the things that we have been doing to enhance our instructional resources and support for this next school year include revising and aligning our curriculum. I've been talking about that since I arrived in the district. Our curriculum staff has been working on scope and sequence documents um, this summer. We're also in implementing our new learning management systems, uh, which are Seesaw and Canvas that I mentioned earlier. Um, and every student will have access to those and teachers will be trained 
We have nearly 8,000 new student devices coming. Um, and I think we have a little good news from the state on those. There, there is some work being done there um, to try to get those to us faster, but also to, to help with some costs. Um, so all those devices that you approved, the 2.5 million, we may, we may likely see um, some cost share of those from the state. Um, we also have some additional um, Wi-Fi spots that are coming. Then um, we have a new device for every teacher that's on the way. The board had already approved those. That had been in the works um, for most of the school year. We've been talking about a replacement cycle plan and also taking care of our teacher devices, which are aged. Um, our new um, technology direct, executive director, Jerry Allen, has been working on expanding internet access for our students. Uh, he's been working with uh, Millette Hopping at the Housing Authority to expand access at um, Kate Ross, Stella Maxey, and South Terrace. In addition, um, they've been installing uh, some broadband access around um, the two high schools and also Cesar Chavez with some plans to add additional middle schools and those uh, that broadcasting um, should cover a full city block. And again, ordering some additional hotspots for students. Um, and I believe those hotspots were also covered in the state's um, connectivity plan that they are just rolling out. And then finally, um, we have, all, have announced to our teachers the opportunity for four days of um, professional development in, uh, online in Google and on Seesaw and Canvas so that they can prepare for the new school year. So a number of things are already in progress um, to make sure that our instructional plan is improved and hopefully we get a better rating from our parents next year in that area. Um, the other thing that we've been talking about is ch a change in the instructional calendar for next school year. So um, we're proposing a um, start after la Labor Day, which would, would have us coming, go ahead and go to the next slide, uh, which would have us beginning school on September the 8th, 8th instead of August the 18th. Um, we think that does a, a lot um, to help us. Uh, number one, it allows some, some time um, to see what happens with the virus itself. And um, perhaps the cases may begin to come down by then, but also um, it allows us to push some professional development days to the front of the calendar and front load those um, so that we have additional time for our teachers to plan. So they will have learned um, how to use the learning management system, and then we can build in some time to their um, work into their contract for next year for them to actually sit and plan lessons with their teammates. Um, and we think that's a good thing. And that's definitely something we heard from them that they would like. Um, the calendar does not change the Thanksgiving break. Um, Christmas is essentially the same. Does push the end of the first semester into January, um, which can be a little tricky with um, dual credit. Um, and the reason we would push that into January is to get a, a better balance between um, the fall and the spring. And um, that, um, that is doable. And we've had some conversations with um, MCC um, in that regard. Uh, spring break is the same. The last day of students would be June the 10th rather than May the 27th. And the last day for teachers would be um, June the 11th. So um, we've reduced the number of student days from 174 to 170. We've picked up some professional development days for our teachers. And um, if our calendar remained the same, our, our school day remained the same, we would have um, 76,500 minutes of instruction or if we extended the school day by 15 minutes, we would have 79,050 minutes of instruction. So a couple of options there. Um, that does, that's a little close on the minimum, 76,500. Um, however, if we have to close and we, we, we know that we can be funded for remote instruction in the event of a closure, I think being tight is okay. 
Um, some staffing considerations that we um, would like to address include, go ahead and push that forward. Um, most teachers will teach either in person or remotely. Some teachers um, could teach both in person and remote, uh, especially for those singleton courses where you're really specialized and we only have one teacher who teaches a subject or two teachers who teach a subject. So for so that, the, that would be limited, we think. Um, In-person or remote teaching assignments will be guided by teachers' preferences to the extent possible. So we wanna be as accommodating as we can, um, but it, this is all going to depend on how many families select full-time remote instruction for their students and how many select in-person instruction. And so we would prioritize remote instruction teaching assignments to teachers who are at higher risk or severe illness from COVID. And then our next priority would be those who live with someone who is high risk. And this will be um, something that will take us some time to work through. We'll need to gather teacher preferences and um, compare those against student preferences, parent, parent and student preferences. And then um, I might mention that COVID, um, Leave is available from the federal government. We have an additional 10 days. Um, our teachers were very concerned about their leave and what happens if they um, become ill and the federal government has provided an additional 80 hours or 10 days of leave directly related to COVID. In terms of um, on-campus health precautions, uh, we have a number of things that we're working on there as well. Um, we're going to recommend and implement daily health and temperature screenings for all staff and students upon arrival at campus. Um, we will implement social distancing to the extent possible. And again, that depends on how many families select full-time remote instruction for their students. And we will um, require masks for all staff and students. We, um, we will work on uh, teaching students about washing their hands and we will implement more frequent, frequent hand washing and um, sanitizing will be required. We'll have to hand sanitizer stations throughout the school and um, possibly in those classrooms as well. Um, we'll be cleaning with hospital grade disinfectants. We've already had healthcare experts look at our, our the, the disinfectants that we use, and we'll increase the frequency of cleaning in our high contact areas. Um, and then we've been looking at dividers and face shields for areas where it's not possible to, to maintain space between people. So there may be some, uh, some need for some um, dividers. Um, in the reception areas, we're, uh, we'll be installing some dividers for uh, between a receptionist and uh, visitors who may need to come into the building and then possible dividers in classrooms where needed. And then um, sharing of supplies and equipment will be limited also. And I might mention there that we've been working with Prosper Waco and um, there is a school supply drive that is in progress um, to provide additional supplies for our students for this, this coming school year. Um, I just wanted to put this out there again. This is the amount of PPE that the state is providing for schools. And of course, we're pur purchasing additional um, PPE and other supplies for the school year. So you can see we have a large number of disposable masks coming. Um, it's really not a lot of masks if you think about the number of students that we have and them being disposable. So we did ask our uh, Prosper Waco if they could include um, washable masks on the school supply list or a school supply drive um, so that we could give those out to students in student sizes as well. Uh, we even see gloves and thermometers and um, hand sanitizer. That's a lot of hand sanitizer, 1,600 gallons. So what's next um, for Waco ISD? Um, we're planning a virtual town hall, uh, just as I did one this past school year um, to visit with families. Um, we'll, we plan to have one next Tuesday evening at six o'clock PM. Families will receive a phone call inviting them to join in on our virtual town hall. 
um, and that will be available both in English and Spanish. And um, parents can also participate by logging in online or listening in on Facebook. And then as for the Board of Trustees, um, we'll bring some additional items to you next year, uh, next year, next week. Um, the calendar will ask you to consider approval of the revised instructional calendar at our meeting next week. That's our regular meeting. Um, and then I will be asking you to approve, um, authorize me to submit our plan to TEA. TEA is requiring our remote instructional plan to be submitted to them um, so that we can get our funding. We're choosing an asynchronous instructional model for remote, um, which will require, um, uh, gives us a little more flexibility in how we deliver uh, instruction through our learning management system and um, will require some attendance accounting there. And then finally, I'm going to ask you to ratify um, stipends for teachers who are completing that Google Canvas and Seesaw training. Um, we are, we're, we're providing a $500 stipend for teachers for those four days of work that's on their own time. Um, and we think that that's fair for them to be compensated uh, because, and we want them all to have that training for the start of the school year so we can improve as a system. And so those are the items that I'll bring to you next um, week for your consideration. And with that, um, we will take your questions, both Kyle and I, or your thoughts or anything you'd like to offer this evening. Um, Susan, something I guess I want to get straight in my head that, okay, It's absolutely necessary at this point that we have to have the uh, in-person learning full-time available to anybody that wants it. And I, I understand that that feature, and, and I do you think that's likely to remain or do you think the TEA may be flexible on that at some point in the coming weeks? Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of pressure around that. Um, I saw uh, Texas Association of School Administrators today um, asked for five um, five things from um, TEA, and and giving us the flexibility for a hybrid model was one of those things. So I don't know. Um, I don't know what tomorrow brings with TEA's announcement. And um, as we've seen over the last several weeks, things have continued to change. So it could be, you know, if we got, if if they loosened up a little bit and allowed us that flexibility, we might be back next week um, talking about a hybrid plan. Um, right. Well, either way, that's still going to be a much more complicated plan to pull together. It is. It's challenging. And so, the, you know, we, even though we might want to do that, that would be very difficult to do that while you're standing up. 100% in-person instruction and 100% remote at the same time. And we, um, you know, we don't want our teachers working all night into the night to do that. To right. Make right. Um, yeah, I was just, it, it, it's too bad. That's our most, uh, from a democratic standpoint, that's obviously our most popular option, but we're mm -hmm. almost categorically unable to do it. Um, okay. I guess uh, you know, we've got three groups to make happy, students, teachers, staff, and then parents and families. Um, I really appreciate all the work that you've done. I, just in further evaluation and assessments as you go along, students remain number one. That's why we're here. And their futures are most important. Um, Thanks for all your work. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Dr. Ken County. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, out of the, uh, what I believe you, they said, the 400 families that was uh, questioned about this, do you have a breakdown of the uh, black, white, and group families? Okay. Do. What, what um, the, uh, I'll Paul, do you have that in front of you? You want to speak? Yeah, if you can give me about 30 seconds, I'll pull it up for you. Okay. Okay. I might actually, hang on just a second. I might have it right here. I've got 
got it, Kyle. I just I have it right at your fingertips. Sorry, right. I've got it up too. Okay, go ahead. Um, so sixteen point three percent of the respondents, or sixty five. Um, identified at the end of the survey as white or Anglo, 126, 31.5% of the respondents identified as African American or Black, 199 or 49.8% of the respondents identified as Latino or Hispanic, one respondent or 0.3% of the respondents identified as Asian American, six or 1.5% identified as other and three or 0.8% of the respondents refused to, re to state how they identified. And that's pretty, that, that's pretty close to our demographics anyway, so I think that's good. It's close. It's a, it's a little over-representation among white and Anglo respondents and a little under-representation around Latino and Hispanic respondents, mm -hmm. but it's close. But it's close. And, and, and the other comment I got, I'm a little disappointed yeah that only about 70% of our teachers responded. I would think that they, they would be a little bit more, they have more vested interest in this. And um, uh, I, I know you probably don't have the answer why only about 70% of the teachers responded. Um, but I, 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 we, we need to work on getting our teachers because they, they, they are the frontline people, they in the trenches, mm -hmm. and more of them should have re responded to that. The other item concerned with, two other items I'm going to be through, uh, you're saying that uh, people will have a chance to make their decisions, but we only going to give them uh, two weeks before school start that they can be locked in. Is, is And that, right. that's cheap, right? So you can't, um, so the thinking there is that if I made a decision about my child today, that I could at least have the opportunity to change my mind two weeks prior to school. So, okay. yeah, it makes it a little challenging for us if the, the numbers are a moving target, but it's fair to parents because they, they, may might, change. they might change their mind depending on their circumstances. Yeah. Okay. All right. And my last, my last one that I, I, I just cannot see this. We going to open school day after Labor Day, and it seems like in all situations recently that uh, when it's a three-day weekend, uh, within a couple of weeks period, it seems like there's always been an uptick in, the, in COVID-19 cases. And we're going to open the day after Labor Day after a three-day holiday. Uh, I, I, I find that hard to uh, accept. I would rather for it to be at least a week to almost two weeks later than that like I say i i just i, I, I that that day after labor day bothers me mm -hmm. yeah i appreciate that feedback i will tell you that um some health authorities in some other communities just uh learned this evening that the dallas area is not allowing schools to start until after labor day that's happening in austin as well um so you if the later you start, then the longer you push, the less days you have in that first semester, and the longer you push back into the back into the summer. So it's it's just a complicated puzzle. Yeah. But thank you yeah. for the feedback. Well, and for clarity, Susan, isn't that the last day that we're allowed to start? Isn't or or do we even have the ability to start later than that? I would think I, I would think you would, but I don't know of any district that would start any later than that. Districts typically want to start sooner, um, so I, that would be. A, I'm not sure I could answer that without doing some research on. I don't know of any rule that says you have to start by. Typically, the rule is you can't start too early <laughs> because um, we, you know, we don't want to interrupt summer and um, tourism. Yeah, I guess I, I'm unclear on what TEA's expectations are for the start date and when and when you begin to jeopardize your funding. Yeah, TEA, um, you know, developing that calendar is a local decision. 
Um, the only, the requirements that we have are that you have to have five days of in-person instruction with 75,600 minutes to get your, um, to get your funding. And if you're offering remote instruction that you have to have daily attendance accounting, um, documenting either um, through minutes for synchronous instruction or through engagement with three different methods for asynchronous instruction. And that's the challenge of the whole thing. The attendance accounting is complex. The state has made it very um, giving, gives us little flexibility and, um, and that requirement of that 100% in-person instruction. So if we could get some relief on that, um, then you know we it would open up um, more possibilities for us to be creative, and um, and certainly would we could make more people happy in this situation. Mm -hmm. And what's the interplay with teacher contracts and the terms of their contracts? Yeah, so teacher contracts are are tied to the instructional calendar. Teacher contracts are 187 days. Um, and so we would adjust the calendar accordingly um, and we would move professional development days that are scheduled now for early August down um, into later August before school starts. So no impact to them on the number of days that they're working. Although, um, like I mentioned before, we're moving some of the student days to professional development so that we have time to, to really work on developing lessons in that learning management system. Dr. Kincannon, um, are we doing the first three weeks remotely to give more of a barrier, you know, health kind of gap for people actually going back into the classroom or is that not part of the discussion? Yeah, that's not an option that the task force um, discussed. We, um, we, that's a possibility. The state would allow that. Um, but what you'll see is that some school districts who are starting now um, in mid August or who are starting in mid August will likely end up in person and within person instruction right after Labor Day. So we end up in the same point at the same place. Um, but we, our decision was to delay the start of the school year into September. Now, if we get to August and things aren't looking good, then we could make some other decisions about that. Um, but right now the recommendation is to start with in-person instruction uh, and, and go from there. And I know we're not really talking about the asynchronous model this time, we're talking about that next week, but I, I think are parents gonna really get a chance to absorb that before they make a decision about doing in person or remote? Well, we'll have the town hall for parents next week and the asynchronous model is what we're proposing. And that model looks very similar to what they were doing um, in the spring. So a synchronous model means you log on and you're live with your teacher um, and that for the state, that means that you're three hours per day live as an elementary student or four hours per day live as a secondary student. Um, the asynchronous model allows you the flexibility to do live instruction, but also to have time for students who are working independently in their learning management system. Um, and so, and it, it, so, um, so that's the plan at this point, and we we will have the town hall for parents this next week, and um, we can we can push additional information out about that as well. And my last question, I think at least for right now, is um, do we know how many families have actually registered their students at this point in comparison? Um, we do. We talked about that today. I don't know that off the top of my head. Uh, we had a link in our principals meeting today for our principals know at each one of their campuses. I don't know if Patrick's on here and could speak to that. Um, our PEMS director or if you had that link, Kyle, and could look that up. I could get, uh, Kyle, you're on mute. We could certainly get you that number. Um, I'm looking it up now, but it'll take me just one second. Okay, so we'll look that up. 
And again, it's early. I think, you know, we expect to have more registered online. I heard Patrick say this year our tra trajectory is good. Um, and we, we do expect to have more online before school starts, but we also expect to have to be registering in person as well. Other Dr. thoughts? Dr. King Cannon? Yes. Uh, with re again, first of all, thank you for the work that you've done on this, getting us to this point to engage and talk about the options and, and uh, looking forward to the forum next week, but with the data that we have seen tonight with regards to engagement and the numbers that we were we were shown, are we prepared to deal with anticipated higher levels of truancy and, and increased levels of, of absences? Um, given the fact that the state's position on, you know, maintaining those levels without any kind of waivers or anything. Yeah, we're, we will have to be really diligent about um, truancy and the state is holding students to that 90% attendance. And um, I appreciate that question. Uh, we haven't worked out the details of that, but that is going to be critical um, to us. We won't receive our funding if our students aren't engaged, even if they're remote. And um, and we will have to track them and, and work harder at that. Um, even more so than we did in the spring. Sure. Okay. Well, yeah, I just, I think there's, there's certainly many clouds on the horizon, but that's kind of an increased level of, of, uh, you know, just being aware and being prepared, you know, so mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Trustee Houston, we have 6,261 students who have been registered online so far. Um, out of, we would expect about 15,000 when all registrations are completed. Who else? Uh, Dr. King Cannon. Yes, Hi, Stephanie. Uh, I, I really appreciate the amount of work um, and conversation uh, that is evident in the report. Uh, it seems very evident that you are taking into consideration everyone's perspective, concerns, um, from parents to teachers, uh, getting community members uh, in the discussion. And so I, I really appreciate it. I think that um, seeing these numbers and the concerns of our teachers and our parents is uh, very helpful. Uh, and it, yeah, I, I think, you know, as I look at this and see TEA's recommendation and what feels um, kind of lacking, uh, for better words, and just uh, the thought and intention that you and your team have put into um, not, not only kind of this enhanced instructional resources and support, but also kind of safety measures for our staff and our students that goes above and beyond what TEA is even recommending. It is um, very obvious to me um, when I look at this report that you are taking into consideration the lives of our students, our teachers, our administrators. And I think, you know, um, I, I just wanted to say I appreciate that. And I think in this time of a pandemic uh, where it's so unknown uh, that it really is, I, I think I just want to say thank you. Thank you for taking these extra safety measures for parents and families who do choose to send their kids to campus, uh, for our teachers and administrators who will be there with them who choose. Um, and thank you for giving them the option uh, to do that. And I know that um, TEA and uh, you're, you're kind of uh, hamstring, hamstrung by what the requirements that they put on you in terms of funding. And uh, yeah, I just really appreciate taking the time, the consideration of everyone involved to, to really kind of look at all sides and come up with what feels like a very well thought out plan. Um, one that's not going to tax our teachers anymore. <laughs> 
what they need to be, and, uh, uh, and, and one that ensures that our students and our families are safe um, or as safe as possible. And so um, thank you for the support. It is very informative. It is obviously food for thought. And um, I think that, you know, watching um, kind of the health district and some of their um, statistics that they're putting out and knowing kind of what our teachers are wanting, what our parents are wanting, um, it's helpful to, to kind of move forward as we find out from the governor what he decides. And, and I really appreciate you putting this together in such short notice and with what feels like such a fluidity of rules. <laughs> So thank you. Uh, thank you. And I just, yeah, I, I'm thankful for the community and the teachers who did participate. Uh, I know it's summer and some people are on vacation and some people are away and maybe didn't have an opportunity to, to chime in. But uh, thank you for the town hall too. I think that'll also be super helpful to, for people to be able to call in and, and talk. Right. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. King. Yes, Mr. Meaning. Okay, I, I have another concern. And also, it's uh, one of the comments that uh, Mr. Watcher uh, read. Um, do we, are we completely staffed to do uh, online and in person teaching? And and uh, I know uh, one thing also I'm concerned about is that he said someone said you know some of our teachers do have health issues and we have to be especially concerned about them and also uh, i spoke to a couple who do volunteer work to the system that they would be coming back and uh are, are we making any preparation cover that. I don't know. I, I, we may not know until the school uh, until school start what impact that's going to have on us, but are we kind of think uh, is that your thinking and your preparation uh, to cover some shortcomings? Um, I'm not sure I caught the last part where you had the word volunteer in there, but I, I can speak to um, numbers of teachers. Again, that's going to be dependent on what our families select in terms of in-person and remote. So we have enough teachers, um, but assigning them to remote or in-person um, is going to be dependent on um, where our students, um, what their preferences are. And I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit on the last part there for me. Okay, the, uh, uh, the, the other concern I have is uh, tutor, who's tutoring after school like that. But the, the, the majority of those people have been senior citizens. And I have heard some of them will not come back in until there's a cure of vaccine for COVID-19. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we, um, we haven't gotten that far in terms of tutors yet. I know that um, we're going to want to have tutoring um, because we're always going to want to help our students who are not where they're supposed to be academically, um, who have fallen behind. But I, you know, we, we will have to get people who are able and willing to do that. And I don't know what that looks like yet, but thank you for bringing that, that point up. Yeah. Susan, are you, can you legally discriminate based on age and health when it comes to assignments for teachers and how that works out? Um, legally discriminate in terms of where we assign them? Age and health. Discriminate based on age and health. Well, you I'm just, Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, I, that was just sort of my question. Traditionally, I think you cannot do that. And of course not. I don't know right. if there's any exception for this situation. Yeah, I I think the exception is based on the health need, right? And so we we will have will have to work with each employee individually 
um, to see what their health needs are. And beyond that, we certainly won't discriminate um, yeah. against anyone for their age. I think if I guess I was thinking about the other, if, if you were attempting to send the younger folks in to do some of the more difficult, or I guess in this term, dangerous assignments and protecting our folks with more fragile conditions. Yeah, no, we'll, can, can we do that? Um, well, I think you do it by talking to staff and see okay. who can do what based on their individual needs. So I don't, I, I think, you know, there are young folk, young people who have health needs too. Right. So I don't think it, I don't think it's all based on age. Okay. Right. Well, I thank you for your feedback this evening. I will be back next week with any new additional information that we have, and then we'll have some items for you to approve for us going forward. And then I'll just remind you that it's fluid. Um, and it will be fluid even after art school. And it's going to be a year of adapting and adjusting um, to the situation that we find ourselves in with this pandemic. So um, nothing is set in stone and, and it, it's, it's been that way since it started and it will continue. Thank okay. you. And I, and I don't intend to cut anybody off anybody else has a question or comment? Angela, I did have one more. Yeah. And it was sort of touched on briefly, and I know we don't know the answer to this yet, but I do know that there has been some discussion and no guidance, but discussion about individual health districts being able to tell schools that you can't open yet because it's not safe in our community or kind of I'm, however that actually works. Um, and I don't know if you have had a chance to discuss that as a task force or just maybe more individually administration wise, but I just wanted some of your insight on, on that piece of, of the scheduling puzzle. Mm -hmm. So the, um, we had a, we, we've had some conversation around um, the health authority being able to uh, make some decisions for closures. And that's what, that's the new thing this week. Um, that's happened in Travis County and that just happened this evening um, in Dow in the DFW airport. Um, and so that's a new development and um, we, we haven't had uh, much time to work through that locally. Um, anyone want to add to that conversation? Well, I, I think what we learned in conversation with um, the county and city today is that um, they are also looking for additional guidance from TEA and the governor, and they haven't received any. So although there were comments made yesterday about um, the involvement or um, the role of the, a health authority and then how that interacts with um, decisions that we have to make, as it stands, nothing's really changed. The uh, media report is just that. Um, and it's maybe um, the, um, the call that was announced today is going to address um, that. Um, well, the call that's scheduled for tomorrow. There's some thinking that maybe um, that will be a subject of the phone call then, but based on what we know now without additional guidance from TEA or the governor, we are really where we were um, July 7th, which is the last time TEA published guidance. Is that is that the right date, Kyle, July 7th? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'd add to, um, to those comments and just say that uh, the local health district is planning to begin regular uh, meetings with school districts um, and that those begin at the end of next week, I believe. And uh, so there'll be some opportunity to collaborate a little bit more there. Yeah, and just one more uh, comment about that is our city and our county have been so gracious and um, willing to give their time to us to um, hear us and, and just kind of talk through 
and around what unfortunately we don't really have a lot of answers for right now. Um, we are all um, being driven by information from TEA and the governor and not enough of it. Um, but um, it is really encouraging to know that um, they are listening to us. They are very um, engaged and also as concerned as we are about our students and staff. So it was encouraging today to um, for them to offer even more conversation between the health authority and uh, school districts as we move forward. Well, thank you very we'll much. Get more guidance on that tomorrow, but so far nothing. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. We, mm -hmm. we have um, we so this is the this is the plan at this point, and of course the. The details follow the will follow um, as we move forward in the coming weeks and to toward the beginning of the school year. And so um, we have a lot of people, a lot of leaders who are are going to step up. And we um, I'm just very pleased by our principals and um, thankful for them and their leadership on their campuses and the work that's going to be done in the in the coming weeks. And so we'll be be back next week with some additional information. If you have questions that you think of in the meantime, um, feel free to send those to me and uh, so that we can address them. Okay, and so for sake of clarity, it'll be next Thursday that we um, consider the calendar proposed mm -hmm. and um, approve the, or not. The stipend for the teachers, the calendar, and then I need to look back at my notes. There was and then do we vote of the plan the plan that then has to be submitted to TEA for their approval? Uh, yeah, I will ask you to give me the authority to submit our plan to TEA um, and, there, and so that we have some time to get that written and submitted to the state. Okay. What is the deadline for that? Oh, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, they, there's some flexibility in that the window opens or may already be open and then um, your funding is contingent on getting that plan in so we'll want to get it in as soon as possible but I don't remember the deadline off the top of my head all right you remember that, Kyle the date no, but it's a it's a two-step review process where they're building in a period for districts to make revisions so um, even though it's a longer time frame that leads into a good chunk of the first semester um, to allow for their review process, it's going to have to be in a little bit earlier in that process. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So next on our agenda is, um, I think, Ms. Davis with um, budget planning. <coughs> All yours. Josh is going to share this with me. Okay, so this is a very quick presentation tonight. We have really um, not a lot of new news. So um, and we've been spending most of our time trying to um, actually build the budget. So what we have tonight has pretty much, I think, all of the general fund built. We have a few additional requests that, that we're still looking at, but the budget is very much, as far as the expenditure side, where it's going to be. Um, I've got a couple of slides in here from last time that um, I bring back just so we can talk about a few new points on them. We talked about the ADA for funding purposes last time. One of the things that is in the TEA guidelines under state funding is the the attendance rate for this coming year cannot exceed the attendance rate for last year. So at this time, I mean, you know, the um, the ADA for this coming year is still very uh, iffy, um, very hard to project. But at this time, we are using this ADA for our funding purposes. Um, on the next slide, we had talked a little bit about those fun and and this has actually changed even in the um, last two days 
but we talked a little bit about some other funding sources that is going to help us um, in the current year and going into next year with our budget. Um, I updated this slide. We have currently identified general fund expenditures um, that total $992,000. That is what we have spent out of our general fund so far as of Monday um, on COVID related expenditures. So we, as again, as we talked about, we've got the 4.9 million coming from um, the federal government that uh, we have to give a portion of that to the private schools. That has changed as well. Originally, we thought we were going to have to give 5% to the private nonprofit schools um, because we were going to have to give uh, funding to all students in the private nonprofit schools, but now with the, we have been given some options that if we're a Title I district, uh, and we are all of our campuses in this district are Title I districts, or Title I students, so um, we will be able to give the private schools just the uh, funding for their Title I um, eligible students. So that will reduce that somewhat. Um, we thought, you know, some, uh, some thought that might be good news, but I think that just means that that helps the state a little bit um, more to plug their hole, because I think they will then just take that much more from us and reduce our state, in reducing our state um, foundation school program money. Um, going on to the next slide, uh, I'm going to just do this one very quickly because this has changed. As I said, we had identified 2.9 million in expenditures that we've already made for um, technology that we are going to use the 4.7 million for. Um, however, we have heard, as Dr. King Cannon mentioned earlier, we've got some news from TEA that they may fund up to 50% of technology expenditures. So we may be looking for some different expenditures for our ESSER funds. The grant is due on August um, 24th. So between now and then, we're going to identify some um, expenditures that we will be able to charge to that grant. Um, on next week's agenda, you will see an item that gives us the gives you notification of our intent to apply for the funds. That is a requirement under the grant. Okay, if you'll go on, Josh. Okay, this is looks at our revenue um, comparison right now. Um, we do not have our certified values. Those will come in a week from tomorrow. Um, I have received a couple of uh, updates on the values since the what we presented on June 11th. They are still tracking very much with what we were looking at then. It looks like at this point in time, and TEA has also put out a template um, to help us calculate that compressed tax rate. And so it's um, very much on target with what we presented in June that that the MNO rate there would be just over a dollar three. Again, we get those uh, certified values uh, a week from tomorrow. So um, we'll be running those numbers so we can propose that rate for you for the proposed budget in early August. Um, but right now looking at this, go ahead, stay on that one, Josh. Okay. so. Right now, it looks like because of our property values increasing, and I've got a comparison between the adopted budget and the projected actual. As we talked about last month, um, our values ended up lower. We had uh, much lower adjustments than we typically do, and our collections have also been lower than they normally are. So um, the projected, um, revenues are at 1.8 million over what we adopted as a budget last year, but they're 3.6 million over what um, our projected actuals are because we're about $2 million lower in those property um, taxes than we had expected to be. Our other local revenues um, up about 13,000 from the original um, budget and up about a million dollars from our uh, projected actual. Most of that, we actually have a decrease 
in our usable local revenue because we have an increase in that category. The pass through money to the TIF zone of property taxes falls under other local revenue. It does not fall into that local property tax category. We have an increase of 1.7 million in that category that will be passed through to the TIF. So we're actually going to see about a $700,000 um, decrease in the other categories, primarily investment income. Um, we are getting very little um, of an interest rate at this point on our investments. Other state foundation school program revenue, um, as the Formulas um, stand now as your local property revenue increases, your state revenue goes down as it has for some time now. So we're expecting about 1.3 million in less as compared to the adopted budget and about 1.7 million less um, compared to the projected actual. TRS on behalf, another pass-through category. So we don't really get to see the benefit of this revenue because it, we, it's just a book entry as we pay TRS, that as the state pays TRS on our behalf, that is increasing. Our federal program revenue um, is a little bit up from the adopted budget, down from our projected actuals, primarily because of E-rate revenue that we have received during the school year. So our total revenue, while it's showing up from the original budget by about two and a half million dollars because so much of that increase is going to the TIF or going or booked as part of our TRS on behalf, we actually will have less um, discretionary funds to spend in this coming year. So that's going to um, limit uh, that the, as we get onto the next, and go ahead, Josh, you can go on to the next screen. This is the base budget. And as you can see, um, we have revenues of, um, put the glasses on, of 166.9 million and expenditures of about 165.9 million. That will give us a million dollars um, in the black right now. However, uh, we do not have some things budgeted that we did in our original budget last year. The 157,000 that you see down there, sort of in the middle of the page, the other uses um, is a negative amount that gets transferred to the Guama Guaca, the, the fund that we um, account for the Guama and Guaca. That's a little bit better than what we are looking at this year. We're looking at about 189,000 being transferred over there. Um, and next year should be about 157,000. As you can see, if you look across in 2018-19, we were transferring $628,000 over to that fund. And now we're down below 200,000. So um, the attendance, uh, and participation in those two programs has increased. And so that transfer that we're making is much less than it's been in the past. Um, with that transfer, we will be in the black about 889,000. Our fund balance, balance at the beginning of the year is projected to be at about 45.9 million um, at the end of this year, starting going into next year. And so we would end up with about 46.8 million um, if we don't do uh, any other projects there included in this budget. And Josh, go on to the next slide. Okay, so looking at those in a little bit different way on our expenditure budget, our base operating budget that we started with this year was 159.1 million. We have now implemented the salary in or put into this budget, the salary increase that um, we'll, you will be looking at uh, later tonight. This is the impact on the general fund only. It's one and a half million dollars. The tax increment fund increase, as I said, is a million seven because it's showing up in the revenue as well as in the expenditures. We had special program increases. Most of our new state revenue was in special program areas, primarily special education, and um, additionally in 
compensatory education. A lot of our increases in, have been in staffing and other costs for uh, special ed. We've probably added about a million dollars in special ed positions as of right now. The other big increase, a million three, is in that TRS on behalf, as we talked about, comes in as revenue and as an expenditure. One of the things that happened with um, House Bill 3 this past year, when they changed the funding formulas, um, we used to have uh, get some credit for the cost of education index and our TRS on behalf was lower because of that. Um, when we were calculating this last year, we did not have that corrected in the system programmatically because it was a new law. And so um, I was not as concerned about it because as I said, it's a revenue and expenditure, offsetting expenditure. So bottom line, it doesn't really impact us, but um, that did increase quite a bit over what we had budgeted last year. And we have other increases, rate increases for things such as um, insurances, tax collection fees, um, other um, unavoidable rate increases, if you will, of about 353,000. So that makes up that expenditure budget of 165.9 million. Now, what is not funded right now are those, um, our SIP projects from last year, maintenance improvements, safety, technology, and vehicles. We did about 6.6 .6 million of those last year. And so right now we're looking at about a million dollars to fund those projects. Uh, Josh, go to the next slide. So um, some of the issues that we still have with looking at this budget, uh, again, we don't really know about enrollment or attendance declines because of the situation we're finding ourselves in. We have, um, you know, Dr. Kincannon and I talked about this and we're at this point in time leaving our enrollment flat. I have lowered our attendance rate by a little bit to account for some um, fall off in attendance. We have additional requests of about $480,000, mostly in technology expenses. Uh, that's 183,000. And we have a couple of dyslexia specialists at 134,000. Um, we have a request for maintenance improvements of 2.5 million and technology replacements of 1.2 million. Um, as well as vehicle replacements for buses of 0.8 million. Um, now, the 1.2 million in technology replacements, because uh, we can charge those under those ESSER funds, we are expecting mm -hmm. that those will cover, because we're, even if we, if we use the 4.7 million, we're not going to be able to identify enough expenditures out of the general fund this year to use up that 4.7 million. So we'll have some of that will carry forward into next year, can even carry forward into um, the following year if necessary. Um, but we're expecting then to pick up that second year of our technology replacements um, with those ESSER funds in next year. So that's, um, that's the second round of student devices that we had presented back um, in the spring. And then it also includes some additional costs for um, some items that we think will not come in until next year, as well as the replacement of some um, technology that was lost in the distribution from this past while the while the campuses were closed. So that is a funding source that we will have to do the technology replacements. We will not be able to do the maintenance projects or the vehicle replacements from that funding source, but um, we have in prior years uh, done the SIP projects after we've adopted the budget and usually we have enough savings to um, come out at, uh, being able to fund those projects uh, through the fund balance. Now, um, we also have some major projects that are not here, such as the Paul Tyson Stadium. We have budgeted the design fees in the current year, but that uh, project 
dollars will have to come out of fund balance as well next year. But we are still looking at that. Again, we will have our um, property values a week from tomorrow and we'll recalculate those, uh, what that tax rate will be. Does look like, as I said, that'll be going down to a dollar three, just over a dollar three, um, so which will be a savings uh, for our taxpayers. Um, not since I guess it's not really a savings since our uh, values go up, but at least we don't have a higher tax rate on top of it. Uh, we will also be looking in, in the proposed budget at the debt service rate. And uh, we have finished next month on debt service. We will um, pay off our 2006 bonds, our, 2000, our series 2010 and our series 2008. So we will be down to just two series left of our bonds. And as we, we talked about in our financial statements um, earlier this year, we paid off our revenue bonds on the stadium. So um, we're positioning ourselves really well in debt service. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, Cheryl? Yes. Um, you may have commented on it, but uh, on the preliminary general budget, fund budget uh intergovernmental charges looks like it's up like well from two years ago up three million and this last year uh to looking at the preliminary budget it's up 2.8 million that's the TIF. okay those are the funds going into the tiff and so much of our value increase has been in the tiff zone okay. and those uh are, and one of the things, this is, I'm glad you asked that question actually, because um, the way the TIF works, when they're compressing our tax rate, we still have to pay into the TIF this, at the same rate that it was in 2005-06, which was $1.45. So what we actually have to, we're increasing a million seven in revenue, but we're going to have to make up that difference as our tax rate goes down. Now the state does give us, does hold us harmless for that. So you'll see that revenue in the state revenue, but that is the TIF. And then, okay, thank you. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Um, I was hoping we could make it all the way to the closed session without a break. Um, I'm willing to, if y'all want to try or um, take a five minute break. What do you, what do y'all think? Keep going. Carrie's good. That's a capital idea. <laughs> okay, we'll keep going, and then we get to closed session. Um, for those of us who haven't eaten, we can uh, take a quick break then and and get something to eat. I'll be good by then. Yeah. No. Yeah. No worries. Okay. Uh, Josie, hi. Hello. Uh, are you up next? Let's see. I am. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Well, good evening, Madam President and Board of Trustees. Tonight, I get the honor to recommend Mrs. Joy Jenkins for Assistant Principal of Tennyson Middle School. Uh, Joy has 16 years of experience in public education, and she has been at Tennyson for the last two years as, serving as their counselor. She uh, She's worked in as a school counselor prior to coming to Wake ISD and also as a middle school math teacher. So I ask that you approve Mrs. Jenkins' contract tonight. Okay. I'll entertain a motion. I'll, I'll motion for it in a second, but I'm just gonna make a comment. Ms. Jenkins was my uh, seventh graders counselor last year. And so I can tell you from personal experience that she is very hardworking amazing amazing employee and so i'm very excited about it so i'd make a motion that we that we do that thank you miss houston a second thank you miss cordawag 
Any other discussion? All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Yes, sir, Mr. Manning. Uh, were we supposed to vote on the other principles also? The others were transfers. Oh. Yes, those uh, the uh, principles that we recommended already had an administrator's contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah, great question. Um, okay, and then the next item is our compensation plan? Yes. Proposal, okay. Okay. Well, on June 11th uh, this year, TASB completed the compensation study and share that with you. And over the last few weeks, uh, some data was updated on the 2020-2021 pay plan. And that was shared with you also in the compensation plan. And the, the compensation plan that was provided to you included an average increase of 1% of, above the midpoint for, well, of the midpoint for all employees, uh, which this gave uh, teachers an average increase of $550. So new teachers will now start upon uh, approval, Teachers, new teachers will start at $49,100. We were already well positioned here in Waco ISD, however, as compared to our market districts, but the increase will allow us to remain competitive. So uh, all, moving to our stipends in the compensation plan, you also had some stipends. Uh, we're recommending the same amount for all stipends except one change, uh, we were recommending that uh, the special ed inclusion resource teachers be moved from $1,000 to 1500. And again, that's to keep us competitive in the market. That was the only uh, recommendation that TAS made where we weren't quite as competitive with our, with our market districts. And again, that uh, increase is included in the stipend schedule that was provided to you. We also included the pay schedules and other recommendations, such as reclassifying titles and pay grade changes. In the packet, you'll also find the substitute schedules and there were no changes made to, your sub, to the substitute schedules, along with the health plan uh, comparisons, healthcare costs by plan, and a list of all the benefits that are offered by Waco ISD. So tonight, the uh, estimated total cost of the pay plans that I present to you is estimated at about $2 million, and that includes the, the benefits. And these costs will be included in the proposed 2020-21 budget. And so tonight, I recommend that you approve the salary increases and pay schedules as presented to you in the compensation plan. I guess, do you have any questions at this time? Madam President. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, my, my question is that um, I thought that usually that this, we don't consider this as a workshop anymore because usually I thought things like this was presented during the workshop and then we would vote on them at the uh, regular meeting. Has something changed that I'm not aware of? We have um, not been following that model um, since um, for a while, maybe a year, um, at least since um, uh, we switched over, uh, maybe with Dr. Rowe, we stopped having the workshop that was the agenda for the regular meeting. Right. And so, right. And so um, we um, have, We've been working, now we're basically working two meetings a month. Um, ideally, <laughs> that third meeting of the month would simply be four workshop items. And I think we've been doing pretty good on that. Um, you'll think, you know, we think the last few months about our architects and the plans and things being presented. Um, so I, I, I don't know, there might be some timing to this particular these items tonight, Dr. Well, well my, 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 my question is that at least when we had the workshop, that we, at least we had another week to uh, contemplate what we're doing. 
But right now, everything is thrown at us at one time, and we have to make a decision right tonight. And yes. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, well, I'm sorry you feel rushed. Um, I think generally, usually, we have not been having this many action right. items on our third meeting of the month. You are correct. Right. In that. Um, and this month um, is different in that respect, and, and I don't really know what the... Well, actually, we, um, I would just say that we presented the salary models um, with TASB um, on, I think that was June 11th. Yes, June 11th. Um, I, I felt like that was a workshop presentation um, for the board to see what, you know, what was being considered in those different scenarios. So the recommendation tonight is the, is the 1% model. Um, the time, okay. yeah, go ahead. Well, well uh, that's fine. Yeah, but I still believe that we should have the opportunity. You present the, the administration present their information, and we still have the time to look over it for the next week and vote on it. I I mean, uh, uh, like I said, you make the recommendations. Now we finally finalized recommendations, and you've given up given them to us tonight, and you want us to vote on them tonight. I. I I don't want this to be a habit. I think, I think, I think, you know, like I said, we've got so many things going on that we should still have the opportunity to at least have a, uh, you know, a week to, to look over this. Uh, and, and I mean, more than like, it's going to pass anyway, but, but I, I still don't, I still don't like being, being rushed. I think, I think uh, we've been rushed in some situations. Okay. Well, well, we, well I just want to speak to that and, and, and be clear that of course, then the notice has we've had it for three days. Um, and that no concerns had been expressed before right now. But secondly, if you feel like you don't have enough information to make a decision tonight and you want to move um, to table it until uh, until next week, you're certainly free to do so. Um, but we have not been repeating our uh, agendas twice in a month as we had been in the past. Our, our, we have been having true workshops on the third uh, Thursday of the month, and then having our regular board meeting on the 4th. Um, but all that being said, I do not want anyone to feel like they haven't had enough time or need more information. Um, and anyone is certainly free to um, make a motion that we table it until next week or to ask questions. Um, and then if, if there's enough concern or questions, we can uh, pull it for consideration next week. So that's that's certainly everyone's prerogative. Madam well, President. Yes, sir. Um, I'm 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 comfortable with the presentation. Um, I think we we've seen this. Um, it's it's not new information, um, and I think we are constantly trying to get our schedules out as we go through recruiting season and what have you to make sure that. Uh, from a recruitment standpoint, we've got schedules out there that we can communicate. So I'm going to make a motion that we accept the compensation plan as presented. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sykes. Anyone wish to second the motion? <clears throat> I'll second it. Uh, carries off my screen. Um, Mr. Dupuy, thank you. So I have a motion and a second to accept the compensation plan as presented. Is there any further question, any more questions or discussion? I will I will support it, but um, like like I said, I, I, I think, yeah, we've been through this and, and this has been the way that we always want to be ahead of everybody else. And because of that, I will support it. I'm in agreement. Um, you know, on that note, I don't I don't want to be dismissive of Trustee Manning's concerns. I kind of agree um, just on a maybe on. And I understand there's a lot of information given to us back in June, but just maybe give us the final product a week ahead of time and uh, give some time to, to, to look over it in the future. But I mean, this is this is not a big foul. I'm, I'm good with it. I, w I wish we could give more money, but these are uncertain times, certainly. Mm -hmm. Is it appropriate for me to just insert a comment? I appreciate the feedback. Um, I just want to point out that we this we 
new in her position. Um, TASB compensation study came in in June, and I am pushing um, to get done so that we can hire people. So it was intentional to get um, to get it to tonight's agenda for you all, so that people know what they're going to make when we hire them. Understood. And, and I, I believe than also, you. Dr. Kim, you can comment on it, but I think it's very much in line with what other districts are doing right now in this climate. And uh, um, I guess we need to move forward to keep our starting salaries, you know, on the on the top of the list. So yes, and we can do a better job next year bringing you more information sooner. So appreciate the feedback. That's and that's what that's what I'm saying. That give us a little bit more time. And I don't think we have never voted against increase in compensation. We will always support that, but I would just like a little bit more time to look at it and and figure out what what we're doing. That that's that's all that's all I'm asking for. Thank you. Yeah, it's a big ticket item. Um, I think it's fair to say there's a lot going on right now. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. Okay. But, uh, um, okay. With that, we have a motion and second. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. aye. I don't think that was an opposition. I think it passes unanimously. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Josie. Um, next on our agenda is consideration of the superintendent's salary. Um, let's see, let me make sure I've got this. Uh, consider, discuss, and take appropriate action regarding the superintendent's salary. Um, I would like to propose uh, that the superintendent's salary be raised at the same uh, 1% that we just approved for teachers. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit in, uh, I'm marveling a bit at the volume of work that has been um, done just around COVID um, and um, I think a raise that's commiserate with our staff and teachers is certainly in order. Um, so that's my motion that we um, raise Dr. Ken Cannon's salary 1%, which is uh, what we just approved for our professional staff. Um, but it, I'm, just, I'm open for a second or uh, I'm, someone else has a different idea. Mm -hmm. I'll okay. second. I'll second. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Sykes. And some discussion. I want to, um, my, my comment is that I do agree that we, we, we are going through some trying times right now. That no if, ands, or buts about that. And I have to admit that uh, Dr. Ken Callen has done a good job in in difficult times, but he, one thing when we hired her, we were not expecting this. So um, um, I'm going to say reluctantly, I do agree because of the situations that, that we're going through right now. And uh, when we when we review it next year, I may have a different opinion, but I, I will I will support it today. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Manning. Anybody else have a comment? Well, I'm in full support of it and not reluctantly, so I think it's a, a good idea. Thank you, Ms. Houston. Stephanie? Uh, Dr. Kincannon, I appreciate all of the work uh, that you have done. I think you have shown excellent um, in your work and uh, I appreciate you um, not, um, um, what, what's the word, considering yourself have, to have the best ideas, but really taking a collaborative approach and uh, changing culture uh, is not always easy, but I have seen a culture shift uh, happening when I get text messages from the town hall from teachers saying that you've done a great job. Um, I'm definitely taking note. So, uh, just wanted to thank you for all the hard work that you've done um, this year. 
I, I can't believe it's just been a year. Has it just been a year? Because <laughs> it feels like longer. <laughs> but uh, just just wanted to thank you. And I think I'm going to echo Carrie's uh, comments when he said we wish we could do more than one percent. <laughs> I wish we could give our teachers and um, administrators a larger raise because I think they too have weathered. Uh, a lot of unknowns and have been flexible and adaptable and uh, yeah, and haven't lost uh, an optimistic attitude. So I just, uh, I guess all this to say thank you. Thank you. Now, Susan, I, I don't know what you thought you were signing up for when you took this job, but I think that this was probably not it. And this is an extremely small token of our appreciation, or at least from my perspective, of the phenomenal amount of work that you've had to take on. And things are complicated enough here in Waco, and this has just been an order of magnitude more difficult than what it should have been. And you. and you still got a lot in front of you. <laughs> between, between now and, and who knows when it ends. At any rate, um, can't thank you enough for the effort. You and Josie and whoever else is listening that works with you on your staff, I know how invaluable they are. Thank you thank all. Thank you. Appreciate that. And let me add a comment. Uh, just appreciate the level of... Uh, I'll say thorough and comprehensive research that you do uh, with your staff in conjunction with your staff to do as much as you can to get everybody on board with the complex issues that we're dealing with right now. And the the, the task that you have, uh, you know, moving the district forward was, you know, a pretty high hill in the first place, let alone coming through the start of this year, uh, calendar year, and uh, facing what we're doing right now since March. So I just applaud uh, uh, the ability that you've had to bring your staff together. Uh, a, a lot of uh, organizational uh, pull, a lot of teamwork, and uh, I think it's incredible. And uh, if, if, if we were in normal times, wow. I, I think we would be seeing uh, all the all the benefit as a result of that. But uh, I, I think you're moving us through these narrow channels in in quite a phenomenal way, Dr. Kincan, and, and certainly want to express my appreciation with uh, uh, all that you've done and all that you continue to do and all that you will be doing. So thank you thank for you. that. Appreciate that, Mr. Vidania. Before I close, I think. Just make sure. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, just I support the decision and appreciate the hard work, you know, the whole staff and all the way to as he does. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I wanted to say to you have built an exceptional team. And um, that's that just doesn't come together. But I think that shows a great deal of respect that people have for you and your leadership, and they have placed a lot of confidence in you um, to lead us all uh, through, like Carrie said, we had enough on our plate without COVID. But um, now um, you are just doing a phenomenal job. And I, you know, you, you, you looked at this, um, COVID-19 issue at every angle and did all you could to get everybody's involvement and engagement in so many different ways. Um, and I too had heard a lot of positive comments from teachers about the engagement that you had with them over uh, Thought Exchange. And then you had 85% of teachers engage in that process. So, so I think we really had a lot of great feedback and I appreciate that. Um, anyway. Yeah. Um, okay, anybody else have anything to say? Otherwise, there's a motion um, on the floor seconded for a 1% raise in, uh, for Dr. Kincannon. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously, thank you. At this point, we're now going to close um, the open meeting 
Um, and convene in closed session under Texas Government Code subchapters D and E uh, for personnel, section 551.074 of the Texas Government Code. We will only be, um, oh no, I wanna do announcements first so that people don't have to wait around for that. Sorry, Kyle. Ah. Thank you, Madam President. Thank Just you. one announcement tonight, and it's something that we've been talking about for a couple of months now, but it's really important for our families, and that's that we want to underscore that the deadline to apply for the pandemic electronic benefit transfer for food benefits has been extend, extended to July 31st. We know that a lot of our families have already applied, but we want to make sure all of our families know that they're eligible for this one-time food benefit because all of our campuses and all of our students receive free school meals as part of the community eligibility provision of the school meal program. Pretty straightforward to apply. You can go online. Um, by visiting hhs.texas.gov slash PEBT, or you can also get help by calling the state's call center at 833-613-6220. And again, that deadline um, is now July 31st to apply for that benefit if you're one of our families and you haven't had an opportunity to do so yet. Thank you. Excellent, good news. Thank you, Kyle. Okay, thank you, Kyle. So with that, um, now we will go into closed session. And when we return, we will not be taking any action, but we will only be returning to the open meeting to adjourn. Um, so uh, for those who have continued to watch the meeting, thank you, but know that if you hang on and wait for us to come back on, there's not gonna be much to see there. Um, for the rest of us, if uh, can we take a five minute break um, before we um, leave and go into the other breakout? And I guess, do we need to do anything, Josh, or you're going to move us all into the breakout room? I will move uh, the eight of you into the breakout room um, when you come back from your break. Okay. All right. I'm going to go do you. dishes. <laughs> With that, we're adjourned. Thank you guys. You're awesome. Great meeting. Awesome.